Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship on this Transfiguration Sunday. Transfiguration is a word to describe what happens to Jesus in today's gospel, and that'll be referenced in the sermon that'll actually kind of tell you about the first lesson. So, our liturgy this morning, for one more time this year, will be uh, the common service. It starts on page 15 in the front of our hymnals. It also says we should then start worship with a hymn, which this morning is number 369, hymn 369, Beautiful Savior. So look up hymn 369, look up page 15, say good morning to people around you, and we'll get started. Thanks for coming. God bless your worship. stand and turn to page 15 in the front of the hymnals. We worship this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me a sinner.
God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Glory be to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord God, before the suffering and death of your one and only Son, you revealed his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. Grant that we who bear his cross on earth may behold by faith the light of his heavenly glory, and so be transformed to shine in, the dark, in this darkened world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The first lesson this morning is Exodus chapter 34, verses 29 to 35. These words will be the basis for the sermon in a few moments. We read. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him and he spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near him, and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. This is God's word. This time I'd invite the children forward to sing up here in the front.
sit down now. <laughs> this morning's second lesson is from 2 Corinthians. We begin reading at verse 12. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the Old Covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the, tru the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand to sing the Alleluia. gospel for the transfiguration of our Lord is recorded in the gospel according to St. Luke, the ninth chapter, starting with the 28th verse. Glory be to you, O Lord. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was, he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw Jesus' glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Let's confess our faith in Christ according to the words of the Nicene Creed. They start on page 18 in the front of our hymnals. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son,
who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, all the children are invited to the chancel steps for a brief children's message. How, how many of you guys have ever seen someone's completely lit, lit up, that their body was actually glowing with light? A few of you? Okay. <laughs> now, I've, I've never, seen, never seen anyone actually glow with light, but the Bible tells us that Moses, when he was with God, his face was, was radiant, that he actually was, his, his face was glowing with light. But do you know there's a way that we can kind of be radiant with our faces too? When, you, when, we, when we smile. Can you guys show me your smiles? Give me your toothiest grin. All right, I want you to turn around, stand up and turn around and, and show everybody your most radiant face, your biggest smile. Yeah. All right, very nice. All right, everybody, turn back here. Okay, now when we, when we think of all that, that Jesus has done for us, that he, that he died on the cross to save us from our sins, we can, we can become radiant too. And maybe we not, won't always be smiling. We won't, we won't actually be lit up with light. But inside we'll, have, we'll, be, we'll be happy. We'll have that peace, knowing that we get to go to heaven and that we can enjoy our lives here on earth. All right, so let's say a prayer. Dear Lord, when we spend time with you, we will become radiant and we will smile in our hearts when we think about the love and the promises you have given us. Thank you for that. Amen. All right, now you can walk. You can walk over to, to Kids Church and if you want to go back to your parents, you're welcome to do that. For the rest of us, we'll, we will sing hymn 95, How Good Lord to Be Here. As Pastor stated before, the sermon text is from 
Exodus chapter 34, about the radiant face of Moses. We'll begin with prayer. Dear Lord, help us to listen to your word, and in so doing, become closer to you, that we may become radiant and reflect your light. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, I think few words are as reviled by movie critics as prequel. Prequels are often seen as simply a ploy to get more money at the box office, a way to squeeze out a few more dollars from an already successful franchise. And some people cringe at the idea of a prequel because they have the potential to flatten out characters or plot lines that were intentionally vague or complicated in the original films. I can see a few of you getting angry right now thinking about a prequel that ruined your favorite movie or trilogy not naming any names. <laughs> but every now and then, there is a rare, good prequel, the elusive, useful prequel that not only manages to give us more insight and depth into the main story, but actually increases our appreciation for that main story more than we already liked it. And I hope that this morning is going to be one of those rare occasions. You see, today the main story is the transfiguration of Jesus. Um, churches across America today are celebrating this at the end of Epiphany and before Lent starts. This is the story, the transfiguration of Jesus. But did you know that there is a prequel? And don't worry, it wasn't a flop. God, God himself wrote it. It's found in Exodus chapter 34, and it's called The Radiant Face of Moses. The main character of that prequel, of course, is Moses. You, maybe you, you've heard of that name, probably. I think Moses is known by Christians and, and Jews alike as probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. It was Moses who freed the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, who led them across the Red Sea on dry land. It was Moses who led them through the land of Rephidim, all the way through the desert up to the foot of Mount Sinai. When God's presence came in, in a great cloud over the mountain, and the very ground shook with fire and smoke. It was Moses who told the people, don't be afraid, this is our God. And when the people were still too afraid to draw near, it was Moses who climbed that mountain all by himself to talk with God on their behalf. It was Moses who said, Lord, show me your glory. And it was Moses who got to see a passing glimpse of God himself as he hid behind a cleft in a rock. It was Moses who received the Ten Commandments. And it was Moses who smashed them to pieces in anger when he saw the Israelites worshiping that golden calf. But it was Moses who went back up that mountain and, and pleaded with God for their lives. And it was Moses, after now a total of 80 days of speaking with God, whose face was radiant as he came down from Mount Sinai carrying the new set of the commandments. It's quite a story already, isn't it? But our prequel really focuses mainly on this last part, the radiant face of Moses. And before we go any further, I want to dispel the notion that it was simply a figurative shining or, or radiance. No, the Hebrew actually says that the skin of his face emitted light. So his face was actually glowing. But, but why? Why would someone's face be radiant? The answer is, first, it was a reflection of the glory which he had seen which, when he was with God on the mountain. It was the result of that partly answered prayer, Lord, show me your glory. You see, God could not at this time fulfill this prayer all the way because, well, he said, no man can see my face and live. But what's amazing about this prayer is that 1,400 years later, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses was there. Moses appeared with Elijah and got to talk to God himself, Jesus Christ, transfigured. He talked to him face to face. And right then and there, this prayer was answered all the way to the fullest extent. 
But back on Mount Sinai, Moses wouldn't have been able to handle it. But the little that he did see, just the, the smallest fraction of God's glory, left quite an impression. After 80 days of talking to God, that impression literally radiated from his face. And he came down the mountain with the second set of the Ten Commandments. Seems like a great thing, but the Israelites didn't think so. They were afraid. In fact, they, they weren't just afraid of him. They, they, they tried to run away. They couldn't even stand to be near him. It's in Exodus chapter 20, they had said to Moses, You speak to us, and we will listen. But don't let God speak to us, or we will die. And that's what Moses had said, don't be afraid. You know, this is our God. This is the one who freed us from the Egyptians, who parted the sea, whose, whose divine love has kept us alive in the desert. In fact, without him, we wouldn't even be alive to, to be afraid of anything. This is our God. Don't be afraid of him. But the Israelites knew what they had done. Before Moses had gone up on the mountain the second time, they had been worshiping that golden calf. They had fallen into idolatry. And when Moses came down, their fear and shame caused them to be afraid. Despite what they knew about their God, they were terrified. Now before we uh, throw the Israelites under the bus and shake our heads, O oh, you of little faith, isn't their reaction human? Isn't it a basic human reaction? I mean, as, as humans, can you see why fear sometimes walks hand in hand with shame or guilt? It is so hard to, to understand that knowing what you've done can sometimes cripple your relationship with God. And it's, it's kind of backwards because getting close to God and being near him is, is the way to know that we're forgiven and that he doesn't want us to feel ashamed. But sometimes the very thought of that manages to bring us more guilt and shame. The, the, reason the, Bible, the reason the Bible is collecting dust on the shelf isn't because we don't have enough time. We make, we make time for all sorts of things. The reason it's on the shelf partly is because the thought of reading it brings the shame and guilt that we haven't been reading it much. Or how often is it that when we fall into a sin, the last thing we want to do is get close to God. We should come to Him in prayer and, and remember that we are forgiven and bring our, bring our cares and worries to Him, but after we've fallen into a sin, that's, that's the last thing we want to do is talk to God about it. And we end up rolling over and falling asleep. But if we could only understand that, that God doesn't want us to feel ashamed. He doesn't want us to feel guilty. And that's, and that's the way it was with the Israelites. When they saw Moses' face lit up, they were afraid of, of the evidence of God's glory there. But really, the light in Moses' face didn't just mean favor for Moses. It also meant favor on the whole nation of Israel. When God lit up Moses' face, it's as if he were saying to them, I have accepted your intercessor. Moses has been pleading for your lives with me. And as proof that I have forgiven you and will pardon you, I have, I have written that in shining light across his forehead. Radiance in Moses meant mercy for Israel. They should have seen him coming down with a new set of the Ten Commandments and a, and a, a face that was radiant and said, Thank the Lord. He has forgiven us. They didn't get it. God wanted to show them that they were forgiven. He didn't want them to feel, feel guilty and ashamed about their sin anymore. And this, this is just the prequel. This is just the, the dim foreshadowing of the reality of the main story. In the main story of Jesus' transfiguration, God said about him... This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When we hear those words, we know that God has not only accepted him as our intercessor, but God chose him to be our intercessor. And, and you know, Moses' face was lit up a little bit. You know, he was, he was glowing. But Jesus takes it to a whole other level. Luke says that 
His clothes looked as if they were woven out of lightning. Matthew says his face shone like the sun. If radiance in Moses meant mercy for Israel, then the light which must have lit up the sky above the Mount of Transfiguration must only mean that we are forgiven a thousand times over. And the prequel really, really shows us just a, a small picture of what we actually experience in Christ. You know, when Moses came back down that mountain, they would continue to sacrifice sheep and, and goats and, and lambs to atone for their sin. But when Moses was on the Mount of Transfiguration, he talked with Christ about what was to come, the things that were going to happen in Jerusalem, where Jesus, as the Lamb of God, would be sacrificed once to atone for all sin. We don't have to sacrifice daily anymore. That sacrifice is good enough for everything we've done. The worst thing you've done, the, the thing you feel the guilt about night after night, that has been forgiven because Jesus' blood is more precious than that. That's our intercessor. And Jesus stands before God, not on a mountain somewhere for 40 days. Jesus stands before God's throne in heaven and pleads for us each day, every day. And he points to his sacrifice and says, Father, forgive them. And then if we understand what Jesus has done, we'll understand that God delights to forgive us. When he says those words to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, this is my son whom I have chosen, he says that to us too. This is my son, this is my daughter whom I have chosen. God wants you to be his family and he wants you to reflect his light. In fact, he has chosen you to reflect his light just like Moses did. I think a good example of this is the moon in our night sky. God has kind of given us a, a cosmic object lesson, if you will. The moon actually doesn't have any light of its own. It reflects the light of the sun. Without the sun, it's just some cold, dark rock floating around in space. We might not even know about it. But with the sun's light, it, it can be pretty pretty bright on a full, when it's full. And, and that's how it is with us. We, without the sun, we have no light of our own. But when it, when it shines, when the word of God, we hear about the son of God, when he shines on us, then we reflect his light. Without that sun in our life, we might be cold and dark with not much meaning, just kind of floating through life. But with him, we can shine radiantly. And that's, that's just how the prequel showed it. Moses came down, and I love this part. It said he didn't even know. He was, a, he was a little light bulb out there in the desert, and he had no idea. He wasn't aware of it. And I think that kind of gets at the heart of what it means to let your light shine. Is that the light of faith often shines brightest when it is an unconscious light. So often we want to, you know, we want to have a stronger faith. We want, to, we want to be able to share our faith better. We want to read the Bible more. We want to do all these things. But the answer isn't try harder or, or be better. The answer is simply spend time with God. You can look at, you can look at so many different ways. You can talk about it with friends. You can, you can, even, you can even try to think of the exact correct words to say Maybe we should stop worrying about the method and just start going back to the source. I can think of a handful of times that I've tried to, to talk to people about God and about my faith, and I try to analyze them and, and say the exact right thing or, or do the right thing, and in the end, I'm getting in the way. I just got to let the light reflect and say the words as they come to me. And maybe they won't be that eloquent, but they'll be honest. And I think there's a, a natural capacity in humans to know when something is fake or real. And when you're trying really hard, people can tell. But if it's just who you are, you're a Christian, you're reflecting the light, that's going to be when you're shining the brightest. When it's just 
your natural reaction. This is, I'm a Christian and my light is just reflecting from God. And isn't that wonderful too? It, it, it takes the pressure off us because it's not our light, really. It's not our light. We're just reflecting. Maybe you aren't aware of any light that you've been reflecting lately. But that's okay. Moses didn't know he was shining either. You never know how God can use you. Maybe it isn't preaching a sermon. Maybe it's just talking to your children about God after dinner. Maybe it's just being there for someone when all the rest of their friends keep failing. Maybe it's just telling them you should try coming to church sometime. Just tell it to them in the most natural way possible. Tell them why you love your Savior. You don't have to say the right thing. You don't have to do the right thing. The, the light of faith doesn't even need words or actions to express itself. But I promise that if we can get close to God like Moses did, if we can read his word, open up those Bibles, if we can come together and gather as Christians around the word here in worship, if we can talk with it, talk to our families about it, then we will shine naturally, whether we're aware of it or not. You know, if, if, the, if the radiant face of Moses was the prequel to Jesus' transfiguration, then our lives must be the unfinished sequel. It's still being written. And only God knows how brightly we can shine, how brightly we can reflect. Now, if you feel like your, your light hasn't been that bright lately, it's not too late to start. If you feel like the light has been fading or your, your reflector is a little dirty, then go back with Moses and stand face to face with the crucified Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration. And the light that is coming from him will make your face radiant. And then look forward to that day when we are all in heaven, when we'll all be literally shining in the radiance of his glory. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God which transcends understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We join to sing the Create Me on page 20. time we'll gather the offering and the friendship registers will be passed out.
Let's stand for closing prayer. Gracious Father, at age 120, Moses' eyes were not yet weak, and he was still able to serve you as your prophet. We give you thanks for our elderly sisters and brothers in Christ, through whom you provide a wonderful example of faith and Christian life. Show them new ways they can serve your kingdom and fulfillment in their lives. Almighty God, you establish government so that we can live with order in this complicated world. Give wisdom and courage to those who are elected and appointed to serve as civil authorities. Watch over those who serve in our armed forces and be with their families. Comforter of the sorrowing and provider for all in need, you alone bring the peace that surpasses understanding. Remember with mercy all who are ill, hospitalized, lonely, afflicted, grief-stricken, and dying. Also provide your presence and your help to those who have special needs. This morning we pray for a safe and productive mission trip for our brother Tim Fry as he uh, travels to Guatemala next weekend. Let all of your people, but especially those in such situations, know your presence and give them your aid and counsel, relief and deliverance according to your good and gracious will. Transfigured Christ, lift up our faces to you that we may reflect your light. Help us to live selfless lives of unconscious radiance so that others might be inspired to come near you. Continue to be our intercessor and remind us that because of you, God delights to forgive his people. Give us joy in our lives of faith and let us make every effort to have a closer relationship with you. Heavenly Father, into your hands we place ourselves and all those for whom we pray, trusting that you are merciful. In the name of your Son who is transfigured and who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. 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 Let's stay standing to sing the final hymn. It's inserted in your bulletin. It's called, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light.
be seated. Good morning, and thanks for coming out to worship. I hope you liked that last hymn. That's a, uh, we had in our worship service today, not by planning, but uh, it turned out like that. Examples of different kinds of, of hymns in the Lutheran Church, ranging from this one, which was written in the last 20 years. It's a modern hymn, not a Christian contemporary song, not that there's anything wrong with that, but hymns are a little different, uh, a little deeper, a little more structured. Then you add the hymn before the sermon, which is, uh, uh, if you look at the bottom, it was a Bach melody, so that's as classic and old and stodgy as it gets, but that's one of the great pieces of music from in Western music. Um, and then you add more of the folk song. I think we all probably like the first hymn, Beautiful Savior. Uh, that's an old European folk song. So a lot of different variety and styles of music, including sometimes con Christian contemporary music at our, in the Lutheran Church. Um, thanks, kids, for singing. I like your song, too. Um, in the bulletin, you notice that Lent starts this week, so just a couple comments. We add to the schedule a Wednesday night service at 7 o'clock. Typically, those services are over in 40 minutes or less. The exception will be this Wednesday because it's Ash Wednesday and we celebrate the Sacrament of Holy Communion in that service every year, so it'll be like 15 minutes longer. Uh, why do you do this? Well, at Lent, you want to get nearer to God. And you don't get nearer to God by wanting to get nearer to God. That's how Americans think. I, I want to be something, so I am something. No, you get nearer to God by putting in some effort, additional effort. Uh, so additional effort would be to be in the Word and receive the sacrament more often. You can do that at home. Read the Bible on your own. Or you can come with your sisters and brothers during the week for a midweek Time in the Word. The themes are in the bulletin. Ash Wednesday is this week, the first day of Lent. The ash part of Ash Wednesday. Uh, a little different. Not all Lutheran churches do it. More and more of them do. But we do offer ashes, actual <laughs> ashes, on Ash Wednesday, not for the supper. Uh, it's a joke. <laughs> but as a symbol of repentance and mortality. So, you don't have to. It's our tradition to not make this part of the worship service, but rather when you come into the sanctuary on um, this Wednesday, let's say you get here at five minutes before church, and you'd like ashes. You come up to the front. Either Vicar and or I will be up here standing in the front, kind of where we do the children's message, and people usually line up, and I'll just put a little ashes on my finger, and I'll say on your as I put it on your forehead, something like, you know, dust you are and to dust you will return. And that's it. Then go sit down. If you don't want that, I don't know if I want ashes on my head, Pastor. Fine. Some do, some don't. It's not a symbol of big believer, little believer. It's just an option. So you can just sit down as normal. So we just make that available. Then, that's enough of that stuff. There's some other things in the bulletin, such as a summer youth trip meeting today after this service. So we'll let everybody go, and then uh, parents and uh, teens, that would be eighth, current eighth graders through current seniors in high school, are welcome to come back in, and we'll explain the Wells International Youth Rally in Colorado this summer, and how our congregation will gear up to get our teens there. Um, so we'll talk about that. And then, of course, this afternoon, there's also a tubing outing, and there's information in the bulletin for you uh, about that as well. Let Vicar and I get to the back door, shake your hands, guests and visitors. We hope you come back, especially. We'll see all of you on Wednesday night, if not before. Uh, I don't. It's something's for supper too. There's free suppers on Wednesdays as well. So anyway, we'll see you and maybe share a meal with you later this week.
and then we're going to have um, the introduction. They usually have these large stages, and we're listening to people who are who are paid to come here. Some of them are traveling from around the world. They've got international speakers. Um, I know a couple of the guys, Pastor Novotny and, and uh, Pastor Reed, are going to be doing some of the small group workshops. So these guys are taking a week out of their out of their year as a pastor or as a as a professor or wherever they are, and they're coming here just to speak. So it's I don't know. It's very high quality. Texas, from, from California, from Canada, little kids from there too, from anywhere, and you'll get to see kids who can share not only the same faith as you, but basically everything the same about the Bible, and they're you know, normal people who like to walk around and shop and bless and listen. So, and then nightly group reflection, I'm not sure exactly what they're going to be, but uh, Pastor put it, it's hard to say and put into words, but it'll be an experience I'm like, I mean, it's not like a vacation.
select your workshops, select yeah. lots of different things, things, fill out your medical stuff, kind of fill in the details. And they, they have all that, all the information is online for you to click and you can, they have like the, I, I, I have the Christian Conduct Covenant, this is one thing you need to get to me, um, that needs to get to me sometime before we leave. Um, or I suppose you can sign it before we get on the bus, but <laughs> maybe a little earlier than that. It's just, um, this says you're going to be a Christian when you're <coughs> some cave tubers in the Black Hills. So they, they're not going to like just say, oh, sorry, that's just how it goes. You're going to have to pan out the rain or God's lightning bolt. They'll, they'll make adjustments um, <coughs> to cover stuff. So they, they try to get you what you signed up for. So then our group might split off. The kids that go from here, are they going to be together? That's another question. Whoever, how many volunteers do we have to lead how many excursions we can go on? You need one, at least one new group leader to be with your group. So let's say we have, um, you guys decide that you want to go on three different excursions the first day um, between, you know, however many there are. So three, three excursions. That means I would go with one group, um, you know, whoever else is volunteering to go the second day and so on. And same with the second day. So if we have, we'll probably have at least four um, group leaders. So that would be probably four trips that, that that group would have. I think we're responsible for kids at the excursion. So that if this group is taking Riley and throwing them on a bus with a bunch of people yeah. from Minnesota. Please come back. Say, hey, no, no, no. We tried to <laughs> <laughs> um, Is the bus driving straight through? Yes. Yes. Okay. And how is it going to work? You know, I looked that up yesterday. I want to say 15. Drivers, it's a it's Great Lakes coach, isn't it? Yes. Um, it's 
doing a good a good job for us. Um, whatever the laws are, that they have to follow. They have to stop them from wanting to do something unfair. But, but yeah, it's just a, it's just a sleep on the bus. But to, to take a passenger bus like this, we're going to have other groups, other churches on the bus. And we need to go out and come back. Um, that's a big thing. That's why. There's no stop. <laughs> um, but it's a lot cheaper this time. And it'll be neat to get to know some kids. I would, I would imagine if you sit on the bus in Michigan, you'll be sitting with friends from church. But when you come back, get equipped and stuff. I mean, it's, 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 it's a good thing. Getting a little about relationships, um, talking about maybe you never about the health thing, but what does a healthy relationship look like? Sharing greatly, me, uh, being a missionary, what does it take to be a missionary to reach a community for a generation or country of students? Becoming a team of there is a spirit that builds. We're not, you know, charismatic, but by the time you leave, 
that closing worship service, it's, uh, you'd run through a wall for Jesus by the time you leave. Um, it's just built because of the workshops, the worship, the fellowship, the prayer, the, the fun. It's, you know, call it group dynamics, whatever, but it's the Holy Spirit building uh, a generation of our church body. You're the ones who will carry the water 20 years from now. God willing, you'll be standing in front of me saying, yeah, I went when I was in high school, and it made a difference. So um, when you leave there, probably more uh, alive in the faith than you could probably anticipate. My bold assumption. Questions? If I was a parent, I would just say, well, how much does it cost? How do you use for your planning purposes 400 acres? Give us, not try to put more on that. The church wants to make sure we have good representation of our, good for our church, for our kids to go. People want to uh, contribute to this. We'll do fundraisers like uh, the car wash that we do every year in May. Uh, babysitting. Try to do some babysitting things, you know, because um, a lot of people like that. Do some service things within our church. But we're going to make it available to our members to contribute directly to the youth fund. And in the past, that's always been, even though we do lots of little fundraisers, <coughs> all the little fundraising is this, the direct contributions we 